Hey, do you teach yoga? Have you ever trained to lead yoga classes to be a yoga therapist? Have you ever owned a yoga studio? Maybe even just wondered what it was like for the women and men up there in front of the room on their mats, leading you through endless Surya Namaskars, down dogs, and pranayamas galore? Well, these are their stories and mine. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, a 20-year yoga teacher, 10-year yoga therapist, yoga studio owner, and co-founder of a yoga-focused nonprofit. I've done a lot in the yoga world over the last 20 years, pretty much everything except had a water cooler. You know, a place to share stories, talk about struggles, successes, and find other people who do the same thing that I do. Welcome to Working in Yoga, a podcast and substitute water cooler for yoga folks to connect and build community, to share our unique profession, our challenges, and our journeys with the world. Hey friends, welcome to Working in Yoga. This week, as we slide ever closer to summer with flowers blooming and our thoughts slipping towards lazy afternoons, I want to plant some seeds that we can harvest later this year. I want to talk about consent. The conversation around consent has been ever evolving over the last seven years or so, and I really think in our post 2020 world, we need to take a deeper look at what consent, touch, and assists really mean. But before we get started, I'm going to ask you to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. And if you love the content, please leave us a review. It helps other yoga pros join our conversation, find friends around the water cooler, and you know we could all use a little bit more of that. And the podcast is sponsored this week by Sunlight Streams, a virtual yoga and self-care platform that is designed to help you build the yoga career you love with the self-care practices, yoga classes, virtual and in-person retreats, and continuing education for all yoga teaching and yoga loving humans. Learn more at www.thesunlightexperience.com backslash online. Now, let's talk about consent. You might be wondering what has got me thinking about consent. Well, it is our guest for next week's episode, Sherry Dostoriba. Sherry is a pelvic health expert, and she and I talked for ages, even after the podcast stopped recording. We talked about things like support for sexual health within yoga therapy spaces, and is it even possible to have consensual touch within a group class? So this week, that is what I'm going to explore. I'm going to start outlining my own experience with touch, consent, and body comments in yoga spaces. So buckle up. I started yoga classes at 19 years old as a college student in the town that I was going to university. That was the very first yoga class I took in the mid-90s, and it had no touch in that class at all that I recall. It was a 90-minute class that had 45 minutes of asana and pranayama, 30 minutes of discussion, and 15 minutes of learning a new kriya or specialized practice. This class taught me how to meditate, both seated and walking, perform nali and neti and more. This class is almost unheard of as a possibility in today's yoga landscape. I don't remember the teachers, but I clearly remember the room, the experience, and the fact that I talked way too much during the discussion time. When I moved abroad, I took yoga classes wherever I could find them, trying out different styles, finding a few more spiritually oriented classes, but many more of the classes that I took started sliding into the more physical realm of things. These more physical classes usually involved heavy touch, but some did not, and honestly, I never questioned. When I moved back home, I started to regularly attend an Iyengar-based yoga studio. There were heavy adjustments, some beneficial for me, and many more were harmful or downright disrespectful, but also, I never questioned. I felt like in that space, it was normal to comment on my body publicly, how my learning process has evolved, put my hands or feet literally anywhere on my person. And honestly, nobody else in the room seemed to mind. So I just went with it. 
Here are some things that yoga instructors have said to me personally over the years. Why can't you tuck your tailbone more? I said, tuck your tailbone. Now I have an extra bone down there, but whatever. That's incredibly difficult for somebody like me. What are your feet doing while stepping on my foot? Um, can you bend your knee a bit more while shoving a foot in the crease of my hip while pulling on my hand? Take your tailbone backwards more while shoving my tailbone backwards with hands into face very close to my rear end. Don't worry, this won't hurt. As a male human stood on my hips in Bhattakanasana or cobbler's pose, rolled his heels backwards towards the floor to externally rotate my hips. He was also at that same time pulling my shoulders backwards with his hands and pushing my torso forwards with his head. So if you can't envision that, imagine someone in cobbler's pose with somebody else standing on their inner thighs, using their feet and body weight to rotate the hips externally or backwards. It's insane that I didn't say anything at that time. Insane. But honestly, this teacher was quite popular in the studio that I was at, and I didn't even question what he was doing. One time someone said to me, it seems like you have a lot of stuff going on down there. Now she was gesturing to my hips, one of which had dysplasia as a baby. So was she talking about that or was she talking about my childhood trauma? Who knows, but I'll say this, during a yoga therapy training, this was especially hurtful to me. Don't touch her, you'll catch her energy. At this time, the teacher was talking about a person in the room who was crying. I know that was a lot for you. Reach out if you need anything. After I had had a physical release in the yoga space where I was shaking and crying for hours afterwards, I did reach out and I received no reply. So <laughs> the thought occurs to me when you make a list of all the messed up things that a yoga teacher has said to me, it sounds way more like a list I would be making if my yoga teachers were an abusive boyfriend, not a spiritual guide or teacher of any kind. But considering my childhood, no wonder it felt normal. So I'm here to talk about consent, especially in the context of yoga classes. What do people consent to when they walk in our doors? What do they consent to with touch, with words, with ideas? I'm going to put some historical context into play here. And we'll start with the 90s because that's when I started practicing yoga. Now, honestly, yoga was so counterculture in the 90s. And if you weren't there, let me just paint the picture. We were not found in fancy studios of any kind. In fact, we were really lucky if we were in spaces that were clean in any kind of way. We were going into back rooms and basements, church centers. One of the first places I taught a yoga class at was also a place where livestock auctions were held. We were in the back rooms of everywhere. Yoga was kind of the quiet secret. And maybe on the coast, you were in more popular spaces where there were tons of people packed mat to mat. But it still was not something that the general population knew about. And touch sensitivity was not a thing. You just went and you went with what was in the room. If you didn't like what was happening or if a teacher was going to come and touch you or address you, you just went somewhere else or didn't come back. Also in the 90s, we were never really questioning the authority of the teacher in front of us. That was also something that really wasn't talked about until much later. Now, come the rise of sort of this great cultural shift that happened for us in the late teens, I will say this, yoga was at the forefront of conversations I was having about the Me Too movement. We were sharing abusive yoga teacher stories. We were talking about power dynamics within the room. We were having discussions about our gurus and who we were going to be listening to. Accessible yoga came on the scene at that time, and I 
always credit Jeeva Heyman for really pushing forward this idea that we were going to make our movement more accessible to more people. We started talking about the rise of consent cards, what it meant in our classrooms, and if we were going to have flip chips, which are essentially drink coasters with one side saying yes and the other side saying no, in our classes as a teacher. We started discussing how our awareness for words mattered. And by the turn of the decade, 2019, 20, early 2020, we were just really tapping into the nuance and depth of this discussion. There were a lot of us at that time doing some variation of consent, whether or not it was a flip chip or the first thing I ever did was bring a bowl of rocks to the room. And if you wanted adjustments during class or assists, you took a rock and you placed it on your mat. But my question then and now is, how empowered are our students to say no? How likely are they to just say yes? Maybe because they feel accountable to the other people in the room, maybe because they're natural people pleasers, maybe because they don't know really what it means to say yes or no to a physical touch that moves their body in space. And then COVID happened. COVID meant we took touch away completely. And a lot of us have not brought it back. Now, I know there is an argument going around, and it is true that touch is vital for human happiness. But my question to you today is this. Is a yoga space the appropriate place to be receiving that touch? As we were stuck online, after we shut down our studios and places to gather in person, yoga professionals had to start learning how to use our words, and we spent a lot more of our time being very specific about what we wanted people to do and why. We had to get used to the idea that it is much easier for our students to say no to us when we aren't in the room with them. One of the gifts, actually, I think there's many gifts, honestly, that COVID has, give us, has, has gifted us as yoga professionals. But one of the biggest gifts is how we've evolved our verbal cueing, how we are so much clearer with our words, and we are able to tell people how to move in space without relying on the use of our hands to move their bodies into the position that we want them to be. We also started using educator language to get our point across, even taking on, if you're like me, some tips and tricks that the educator community has been using for years in order to educate people online. We were given the gift of handing a yoga practice back to our students. And that's something that, in my opinion, was too long in the sole hands of us, the teachers who were in front of the room. Now, three years later, here is my perhaps unpopular opinion. I don't think there's ever going to be an appropriate time to touch people in a group class. Consent cards, even if you have them, don't really acknowledge the public nature of class, the power differential between teacher and student, and the changing variables that happen to our students within class. I've heard too many students say to me, well, I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to hurt, insert teacher's name, her, his, their feelings. And I also want to plant one more seed, something that I think we don't often talk about when we're discussing consent, assists, and what that means in our yoga spaces. I want to plant the idea that we need to think about what I call good girl culture. This is the culture that desires to seek out perfection, outward acceptance, and the thought that someone else has the answer to your inner questions. This is the antithesis of yoga, y'all. Yet our continued professional reliance on assists or adjustments feeds squarely into this narrative. You're not good enough, so don't worry, I'll fix you. Let me ask you this. How many times has a student asked, am I doing this right? While doing exactly whatever shape that 
you've asked their body to be doing. Did you dig deep and explore why they asked you that question? Why did they feel like how they showed up in that moment was less than worthy of praise? Now, is it even possible for us to let go of the idea that there's a quote unquote right way to do a pose? Because if there is a right way, what are we teaching? Are we teaching gymnastics? Are we teaching calisthenics? Or are we teaching yoga? And how do we maintain touch in our group classes and also claim inclusivity and accessibility in our yoga rooms? How do we keep those who have suffered from trauma feeling safe in our spaces? Especially since I will say here what we all know, there are more of us in our yoga spaces who have suffered trauma than not. And finally, can we really reckon with the fact that our words truly matter? What comments, ideas, and thoughts have our students really consented to hearing when they bought a ticket to our class? The amount of times over the last 25 plus years, if not longer, that I've been practicing yoga, I don't know that I want to do the math, yeah, 25 years that I've been practicing yoga, that I have had a yoga teacher in the front of the class lecture me about the environment. Let me ask you this. Do your students consent to that lecture about the environment when they come into a yoga class? Because the breadth and depth of yoga philosophy is very deep and very wide. You can make almost any perspective slide into a yoga philosophical conversation. Is that what your students consented to when they walked into their class? I do really want to evolve this conversation of consent past drink coasters, standing on students, and casual comments about tight hips or loose muscles and body mechanics. Can we evolve our teaching language? Can we embrace our role as guides to our students and support their personal growth without having to add our own judgment? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Make sure that you hit me up on social media. You can follow me on Instagram at Rebecca Sebastian Yoga, or email me, Rebecca at workinginyoga.com. Thank you for listening, and I will catch you around the water cooler next time.